All right, welcome to another podcast. I'm so excited to introduce uh, our guest today, Dr. Lorraine Wilcox. She is a professor, an author, a translator. You might not know this, a YouTuber, more on that, but she's also a presenter at this year's 2022 Pacific Symposium. She's got such awesome presentations in the morning for an hour. She's got a lecture called Pills, Powders, and Decoctions, why we still need different formats for formula. And we talked a lot about that before I hit record, so hopefully we can recreate that. But in the afternoon, you're gonna have a whole lot of fun in the three hour workshop, making Chinese herbal syrups. And that's exactly what you're gonna do. I've watched her videos online on YouTube and on eLotus where she's actually making these syrups. It's super fun, dear to my heart, because I love making things. So without further ado, I want to introduce Lorraine and Lorraine, can you start by explaining a little bit more about your morning one hour talk on pills, powders and decoctions and why it's important that we pay attention to the original format that the formula was created in rather than being so convenient these days, like, oh, just give everybody pills or everybody granules. Why might we want to look at that and how can we maybe even adjust that slightly? Thank you, East. And so this is a topic that I never heard of when I was in school and I never heard of for many years after, but I was like looking through Li Shuzhen's Ban Sao Gangmu, this really famous Ming Dynasty herbal book, and I came across a passage that said that, um, you know, pills do different things than powders, which do different things than syrups, which do different things than decoction. And suddenly, you know, a question I always had, why is it Xiaoya San, not Xiaoya One or Xiaoya Tang? You know, suddenly a lot of things became clear to me. I do want to say, I'm not demanding that everybody cook things in their original format because, you know, your patient has to be willing to take it and you have to have the time, and the skill to do it. But I think if we don't even know that this is a factor that the ancient people use, they, you know, use sun to enhance certain characteristics of certain formulas. They thought pills would deliver the formula to certain regions in the body and not other regions. And so I think this is kind of just an important factor for us to consider, um, you know, when we're making a formula or when we're prescribing a formula. I, I love that. Like we were talking about before I hit record, I know in my own practice, I got really, I guess you could call it lazy, where I just went to all pills. Or for a while, I went to all granules, and I, I probably did learn this in Chinese medical school back in the late 90s and probably forgot it just as quick, the importance um, of the pill versus the powder versus the tincture or the syrup and what, what actions it elicits in the body. So that's really what you're going to kind of cover. You only have a, an hour in the morning, but I, it sounds like they're going to get a lot from that. Just a reminder and a reinforcement and possibly some strategies on how to incorporate the original format in practice? Yeah, I, I mean, what I would ask is if you could make your herbalism just a, a percent more effective, wouldn't you consider this thing that would do it? So, I mean, we have to decide we're modern people. We may be skeptical about certain ancient ideas, but again, we can't evaluate these ideas till we know about them. And so that's yep. what I talk about. Um, but I will say I am taking some granules right now because it's a formula that is not easy to make. <laughs> so, <Decocked. laughs> yeah, so I understand that not everybody's going to go for this. But again, I think knowledge should be out there. I love it. I love it. It, it also ties in two things. I've been interviewing several of the presenters for this year's symposium, and it feels like the theme is return to classics. So your morning lecture definitely fits in with the theme of more to class, uh, return to classics, right? Return to the roots of our medicine. But I also just love how we were talking about this earlier, that you were studying Chinese medicine and you started to get bored, almost disheartened until you got into your translation work. 
and started to see the beauty of the medicine through the, like doing your own translations. I know that you have written two books, translated several books, edited other translations, you know, so you're very heavily an author that way. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Like, how did that happen? You're in, you're doing Chinese medicine and you got woed by the language in translation. So when I was in acupuncture school, I didn't have enough leftover brain cells to study Chinese at the same time. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of herbs, a lot of points, a lot of formulas. I just was interested, but couldn't do it. And then after I graduated, I got bored with it pretty quickly. It just seemed flat and not very inspiring. And then um, I got kind of diverted by, I found a feng shui teacher and I started really studying with him. And it ended up that for him, I got a Chinese English dictionary and tried to translate some things for him. And once I found translations like, whoa, this is amazing. And, and pretty soon after that, I started trying to translate things from Chinese books. But I was more interested in the old books than like modern scientific um, kind of Chinese medicine stuff. So even when I could understand only tiny bits, even when I was just really learning what a word actually meant, I felt like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz when it goes from black and white, suddenly it's all in color. And it just totally, you know, continues to revolutionize the way I look at the medicine. It's just so much more amazing in Chinese. So I hope to bring some of that out for other people to discover I feel like I'm data mining you know I'm finding like hidden treasure everywhere um yeah it's just like a passion for me so at night when I'm tired I don't watch tv I don't do crossword puzzles I like just try to translate things because for me that's a better puzzle <laughs> yeah wow. I love that <laughs> I know your two books are a mock Sebastian. so where did that love affair that connection with Moxa begin for you? I had to write a big long paper. <laughs> and so I was looking for a topic and originally I wanted to write about the eating and medicine, but that's just so complex. And it would also be hard to find advisors who were qualified to really work with it. So at some point I said, okay, let me do something more practical. And I had already discovered, do you know how people always say, oh, ancient doctors were either herbalists or they were acupuncturists. They were two separate professions. They weren't the same profession. Not correct. So I had been looking into Judan Shi is a really famous UN dynasty doctor. He talks about Mark Sebastian a bunch. He talks about bleeding a bunch. He actually didn't a lot of acupuncture, but he did talk about moxa. It's like, wow, this ancient, one of the most famous herbalists ever likes moxa. Um, you know, and, and Zhang Jiebin, a Ming dynasty, super famous doctor. He has a whole volume of one of his books, moxa point formulas, you know, how to treat this, how to treat that, how to treat the next thing. So I had already stumbled upon those things. And I thought, wow, I, you know, there's hardly anything in English about moxa. I want to, I want to translate stuff. So it is a book with lots of translation in it, but it's not translating one text. It's like finding moxa information in all these places, bringing it together. And so the first book is pretty historical and the second book is more practical and more modern stuff. But yeah, that's how I found moxa. And okay. of course I had to try everything on myself, on my own body. So like, yeah, I burnt myself a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when you're translating, sometimes you can't understand, like the words may have more than one way you could translate them and you're not sure which, and it's a practical thing. So I realized I had to try some of this stuff in order to make better translation. And so then I got into, you know, kind of trying to revitalize certain old moxa techniques that aren't used so much anymore, trying them on myself and then writing about them and teaching classes in moxa and and this and that and after that i got into the same thing for herbal preparation and syrups 
Yeah. So how it now enters the stage, your syrups and making those. And how did you get into doing the syrups? Uh, well, by the time I found syrups, I had already been making honey pills and water pills and, you know, like making, um, you know, Shen Chi Wan or, or Lu Wei Di Huang Wan honey pills the way following old recipes and and Baoho one is a water pill it wasn't made with honey it was just you know ground up herbs and and water and sometimes a little bit of flour to bind it together so I had already been playing with this kind of stuff and then I don't know if you know Henry McCann he's a east coast practitioner that's really amazing and um, somehow we got to talking about making syrups and he gave me some class handouts from when he you know, was teaching making syrups. So I, I really owe a lot to him when it comes to syrups. Um, so I just tried his recipe and the, the recipe he had makes a huge quantity, but I didn't realize it because I had never made syrups before. So it's like I'm boiling it down, I'm boiling it down, I'm boiling it down, and I have to leave it simmering overnight, and it's still too much. And you know, it took me days to boil it down the right amount. So it's like I learned a lot since then. You always, you know, do it kind of the inconvenient way at first, and eventually you figure out how to do it properly. But and yeah, start small with syrups. <laughs> and that and so that you're actually going to make syrups at symposium you are on saturday i think um november 5th two to five chinese herbal syrups you shared with me you're actually going to prepare and make syrups and then have some for tasting right we're going to make one that's called gochi gao which is gochiza as made into a, a syrup that's what we'll make in class but i'm going to bring a couple others with me because there's not time to make like three syrups in class and people can taste them and um, see what they think. Syrups are a lot of work to make, but you can make a huge batch and they stay preserved for a long time, like the honey or molasses. I, I make um, suwu tongue as a syrup with molasses because you know iron content in molasses and but when nice. it has when it's honey or it's molasses they last for a year so even if you have to make a large quantity you know it, you make a large quantity and it's a lot of work but it's you can make a year's worth at a time wow is it important to keep syrups in glass containers my background is in aromatherapy and i did a lot of similar investigation, experimentation with aromatherapy. In aromatherapy, it is very important that you keep it in a dark glass container to keep light out and to preserve the essential oils. Are syrups the same way or plastic? I okay? probably would, but you know, mostly I would keep an open jar in the refrigerator where there's not a lot of light. And then also if I have a bunch of bottles of it, they might be stored in a cardboard box so no light gets in. So sure, if you have the money to buy those you know, fancy jars, which can get a little expensive, that's optimal. But, you know, sometimes I'm using, if it's for myself, leftover jars, you know, from <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I try to light in, in a cool place. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. I love it. I think <laughs> both of these sections just sound phenomenal. Um, you are a professor at Emperors in LA, also at AMU, Alhambra Medical University. So you physically are in Los Angeles. I know you do some continuing education classes for people and your book, both books are available on Amazon. Also, if people want to engage with you in any way, it's, they do it through YouTube or your Facebook page. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a big old fancy web. <laughs> And I love that. I tell people all the time, you don't need business cards and you don't need a website. <laughs> you just need to be good at what you do. You need to have a joy and passion for it because it becomes contagious. L like with you, like you, it's clearly evident for those of you that are just listening, you cannot see the joy radiated, radiating out of this woman's face when she talks about these things. It's contagious. And that's really all you need is you need to have that passion, that drive, that commitment to sharing what you're uncovering out there through your translations and your experimentation. And um, that's perfect. That's, and that's how people can get a hold of you besides 
coming to symposium, seeing you there or going to Facebook. Are you going to be speaking or lecturing at other conventions or conferences coming up? Uh, no, I not really. I have like for, at AMU, they have kind of an internal CEU thing. So I'm going to teach something, but it's not generally like public. I don't have anything scheduled right now. Not right I now. Just... How about a third book? Do we have another book coming through? I, I am working on a book on the concept of constraint, but I'm not sure I'll get it done. I've started so many books and not <laughs> all of them get finished but that's fine because it keeps me out of trouble in the meantime <laughs> you know I'm, I'm obsessed and so i'm not out spending money or doing this or doing that but can i tell you something else that i is kind of exciting for yes me? please 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 I, please uh some years ago i translated a book that's called miscellaneous records of a female doctor in the ming dynasty there was this woman who had a scholarly education her name was Tan Yun Shen and she you know was a doctor and she was treating actually only women and girls um but it wasn't all gynecology I mean women have all kinds of things but there are all these social you know things that made it harder for women to interact with men that weren't related so she wrote up I think 31 case studies and it was published in the book almost when like you know was lost which means no copies exist there's like one copy in the world of like her original book and I was fortunate enough to be able to get like photos of that and translate it okay so move forward a few years i get a phone call and it's like hello is this lorraine wilcox yes this is lisa c i don't know if you know who she is but she's written amazing novels <clears throat> excuse me about women in ancient china um she's like pretty well known if you like reading novels about <laughs> east asian women and yeah. So she's saying like, hey, it's the pandemic. I can't go out to do research. I want to write a novel. And I came across your translation. I want to write Tan Yun Shen, this woman doctor's story. And so it's written, although it's still going through the editing process and it will be published next year. So that's just so exciting for me. I've read like all of Lisa C's books and then she called me and everything. So that's just like, like one big news I've had. Um, I was, love, I love that. What is the name of the book? She hasn't divulged the name of the mm. book. She's, I mean, she hardly even talks about what it's about yet. She's like kind of keeping it a little bit secret. So I don't know if I'm blowing her thing, but um, you know, like I'm just, I mean, if I had to pick somebody to write this doctor's story, I would have picked her. I love so. it. That's awesome. <laughs> Lisa C, just like the letter C or is S it? S-E-E. S-E-E, -E. -E, okay. Oh my gosh. I love that. Okay, number... everybody look out for Lisa C and her latest book that's coming out and you'll know where the stories actually came from. I love that is an amazing story. One copy left and you resurrected it and kept it alive. Well, actually there's a scholar named Charlotte Firth who just died this month or last month unfortunately and she was the one who found it in a rare books library in china and she took photo of it and then she lived in la and and we knew each other and she gave me a copy which sat in my closet for years before i said huh let me look at this i'm bored here's something new <laughs> <laughs> and i just fell in love with dr tan um, oh I wonder what other gems are in your closet. <laughs> Probably just a lot of junk for the most part, but there are gems still to be found out there. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Okay. So we will be on the lookout for that. We will also be on the lookout for you at Symposium. Looks like you're there Saturday in the morning and then that workshop in the afternoon. And I'll be there. So I'll come and say hi to you and we can meet each other in person. Nice. All I'm right. kind of afraid. I hope that we're not in a peak of pandemic at that time. No, no, no. I know. I, it's so lovely to be out and about again. I'm doing events again. I'm meeting people in person again. 
And so that's what I'm going to speak into the, I guess, the world of possibility that we're all there. We have a wonderful symposium live, get to see each other, learn from each other because you have so much to share with everybody. And um, I'm thrilled that you're going to be there this year at symposium. So we'll keep that. We'll keep that out there for us. Thank you. Peace. All right, Lorraine, thank you so much for the interview and we'll see you in a, just a few months. Looking forward to it. Me too. Bye for now. Bye.